I was born in southern Hungary, Moko, 4th of February 1932. I mean, the, the, there's record of Jews being in Hungary for eight, nine hundred years, and anti-Semitism has been nothing unusual. But somehow or other, we seem to have accepted the fact that, that as Jews, we, we are not supposed to be the equivalent of the non-Jews. Put, put it on the table, shall I? Going to school literally was like running the gauntlet. Invariably, you encounter an awful lot of uh, anti-Semitism. That's my brother. That's my wife and me, my brother's wedding. Nothing unusual of being sort of cursed or spat at or even punched. But somehow rather, that was part and parcel of life. It accepted that you were a Jew, they were non-Jews, so you had hard to suffer for it. As an ally of the Axis powers, Hungary fought alongside the Nazis during World War II. The Hungarian government also passed similar anti-Semitic laws to those introduced by Hitler in Germany, but stopped short of inflicting the Nazis' final solution on their Jewish population. But Ivor heard rumours of the horror being committed by the Nazis elsewhere in Europe. One day I remember three Polish Jews turned up in the synagogue and they said, listen brethren, listen brothers and sisters, you know, we are being ac actually buried alive, killed, and poisoned, and guessed, and burned. And they said, no, come on, come on, this is hungry, that sort of thing doesn't happen. But how true it turned out to be. By 1944, it was clear Germany would lose the war. Seeing the tide was turning, Hungary made peace overtures to the Allied forces. Once Germany found out about that, they completely occupied Hungary altogether. And within, literally within two or three months, the, the uh, whole Jewish Christian population were practically wiped out. It wasn't like overnight, everything was dark and before there was daylight. Everything was very, very gradual. I mean, as a Jew, you were, you were, you were used to suffering. And the first they said, well, you know, you, uh, you mustn't fraternize with non-Jewish people. I said, well, so we all live amongst ourselves. And then he said, you mustn't go out after eight o'clock. No, we won't go out after eight o'clock. And then you mustn't marry non-Jewish people. It's no problem. And then, of course, it came out, they said, what might happen? You'll have to go into the ghetto, and then you'll be taken east, given, over, given some farmland, and be able to look after yourself. And to us, that sounded a very, very wonderful idea. I mean, being harassed over here, anti-Semitism was right. Well, what's wrong? You might be put into the train, taken east, somewhere, east Europe, whatever it was. They realised that afterwards, where we were being taken to. Ivor's father and eldest brother had already been sent away to serve in the labour battalions, the German army's slave labour workforce on the front line. This is my eldest brother, a religious person. I think he was a rabbi by then at 22. When he arrived in Auschwitz, do you know where he was made to work? Have you heard of Zonder Commando? The Zonder Commando were the people, youngsters, who were big enough and able enough to get rid of all the people that were guests. They put it in the, uh, in the guest oven, in the uh, crematoria. I don't know what happened to him, but obviously they said that all those, none of those people survived more than four weeks. After four weeks, they rotated them and they themselves were burned. Eventually, we heard it into a big football pitch and they're full of tents. And that's when I first encountered death. When they were walking along one morning, you could see in a tent that a number of people had committed suicide. And one of the first one, an awful lot of con an awful commotion going on, was a doctor and the wife and a small child who killed themselves because either they knew or they couldn't bear what was happening to them. Ivor and his family were crammed into a cramped train with hundreds of others. Without food, water or adequate ventilation, many didn't live to see the doors open at the other end of their three-day journey. When the train did stop, you could see that a place called, you arrived at a place called Auschwitz, that Arbeit macht frei, that, you know, will make you free. You could see through the slits in the cattle truck, people with striped uniform working, kept in shouting in Yiddish, eat all the food, don't save any food, because obviously 
food was a very, very uh, uh, sort of big part of our life. Always hoarding it, not eating too much, make sure you save some. And he said, don't save any food. And he said, children who are asked, when they ask, they must say they are at least 16 years old or over. The doors opened up. We fell out onto the, onto the ground. The scene there was absolutely awful, you know, like dogs, Germans, guns everywhere, all over the place, screaming, shouting, women and children on one side, and young, you know, elder boys and men the other side. And as we started marching, I started running over to my mother's side. She said, what are you doing here? I said, I want to go with your mum. I said, no, no, don't, don't, go on, you go back to your brothers and I go with them. There was a, a German officer with white gloves pointing left and right. No idea what, why. And suddenly he saw me, he stopped. He asked you, how old are you? Which in German is the very, very, very keen to Yiddish. I said, 16, 18. And I swear to you, for a millisecond, literally for a millisecond, he stopped and, and he, he said, oh, go on, go to the right, meaning to the worker's side. Now, if I would have known Yiddish, I would have understood what the men said. They asked me, how old are you? I would have said I was 12. Although I was overweight for my, for my age at the time, that no matter how big I must have been, it would never let me live if I was saying I was 12 years old. According to some statistics, they say it was Dr. Mengele. As head camp doctor, Mengele oversaw a program of barbaric and inhumane medical experiments, often on children, in particular twins, by which he hoped to prove the Nazis' crackpot theory of Aryan racial dominance. He was responsible for deciding who of the people arriving at the camp would live and who would die. Just Ivor and his brother survived the selection process. His mother and seven of his siblings were all sent to the gas chambers. Auschwitz was the most notorious of the Nazi concentration and death camps. It was actually comprising several different camps. Some of them were areas where people were made to work as slave laborers. But of course there was an extermination camp on the site where 1.1 million people were murdered. 90% of those were Jewish people. Many others were of Roma and Sinti heritage. Uh, and there were other, other people from other backgrounds murdered as well. The scene itself was, it was a horrendous scene. It was like in a big air cut hangar. Hundreds, hundreds of people there. People coming with running with blood all over from the body because what they were doing, all the hair was cut off from you as you went in there before they had a shower. And the, big, the people who were cutting the hair were the inmates themselves. And the German just come saying, quicker, 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 come on. And of course, you couldn't care less how you cut the hair under the arm or from your pubic part or from your head. Ivor and his brother were sent to the camp barracks. And they said, no, listen, people, you've arrived at a place called the Auschwitz, don't you forget it. And you're being given a number now. You do not exist except for that number. Forget that number and you will not live. And as he was saying it, somebody brought in two couples, brought in a man, spread the eagle onto the floor and it was being punished. And he said, this is what's going to happen to you if any, any time you do something you're not supposed to. You know, if, if I say whatever it is, you jump immediately. And suddenly I started crying. And a, an older man came over to me and said, why are you crying? I said, I want to see my mum. Even being selected in Auschwitz for life, being selected to do slave labour rather than go straight to the gas chambers, was still no guarantee that life would continue more than that moment. Conditions in the camps were horrendous. We know that prisoners were given very thin clothing, uh, even in sub-zero temperatures in, in the Polish winters. We know they were crammed into bunks in the barracks. We know they had very, very little food. They were starving. They were fighting for, for food. They would share one bowl of soup between several prisoners and yet had to go out to undertake very rigorous uh, slave labour work. 
but you didn't have any clothes, you didn't have any food, you didn't have any anything, so anything you could get hold of, you grabbed. And of course, what I meant about clothes, so if you went to bed with someone and a person died next, next to you, all you, the first thing you kept on saying is, can I use their clothes, rather than, oh dear me, look what happened to him. Now, and the other thing, what, how you knew that somebody died next to you, is when the fleas, you're full of fleas from, from the clothes and from disease and whatnot, and you could see the fleas are flying away from the body. Then you realize the person next to you is dead. I feel ashamed of what humanity can do. And and scared if people don't take notice what they can do again. In early 1945, with Soviet troops bearing down on the camp, the Nazis moved the prisoners west. Wherever you went, you were never told where you were going. You were giving a loaf of bread and said, now that will have to last you as long as it takes. No idea what, when or why. You know, uh, sometimes it only took a day, sometimes two or three days as well until they arrived, of course, in other camps. But of course, the other camps were not Auschwitz, but the first thing that greeted you as you left, as you went to another camp was the amount of wheelbarrows walking about with dead people on it. Death was always, always in front of you. A few months later, American troops were closing in from the west and the prisoners were moved again. This kind of former line two by twos, and every third person was given a loaf of bread. So of course I went along with my brother, we had a loaf of bread. We were marching along in Bavaria in, in March, uh, horrible. I'm not quite sure how many days. We went past an awful lot of Bavarian villages. Some, some villages came out through stones at us. Some villages came out and threw bread at us. Eventually, after about four or five days of death march, we arrived at a place called Dachau. The, the general was given order to take us to the Roll Mountains to be caught, to be shot. And he, he went to the camp commandant in, in Dachau and he said, he's not taking, not carrying out the order because obviously the war crimes, etc. He said, all right, they'll have to bivacate outside in, in the parade ground. So we were there for about a day and a half until we heard artillery fire. And one of, the, one of the shells landed by the wire, not too far from where we were. And my brother said to me, come on, Ivor, let's run. And literally, we took two or three steps. Suddenly, we heard machine gun fire from the tower. But the German guards were there opening up his machine guns. So, of course, we all ran back quickly. The following evening, the following morning, the same thing happened again. Of course, my brother said, come on, let's go. And so I didn't want to, but you could see by this time, somehow it was different. So we went through the hole in the, with the shell opened up. Of course, the guards escaped, but rather ran away as well because the Americans were coming. So I remember going past an anti-aircraft battery outside the camp, and there was a dead rabbit on the field. And that was about the first meal I remember having after liberation. Ivor was liberated by American troops in spring 1945. Of their family of 11, just Ivor and his brother survived the Holocaust. Yes, this was me when I came to England in 1946-47. In total, more than 500,000 Hungarian Jews were murdered, more than half of all who lived there. I myself could not believe the experience I had and how humanity can lower to that state. And in fact, I genuinely believe that the only way through all this terrible tragedy is through love, not through hate. I was liberated when I was 13 years old and I'm 87 years, so I've lived a few years. And I can genuinely say that, and especially in human nature in general, in life, in marriage, in, in everything as well, that love will get you a lot, a lot further and a lot better result than hatred.